see you in the house of God today. What an honor uh, and a privilege to gather together. You know, there's few things that I enjoy more than opening up God's word with a group of people. And uh, I've studied the Bible by myself, and it's fun, and, you know, you kind of get lost sometimes in it, but it's even better. You get around other people. You get around people that maybe are trying to figure it out, too, people that come from different backgrounds, different walks of life. And so we're thankful that we have a church that's diverse. we got former Catholics here. we got some Lutherans here. we got some Presbyterians here. we just got some people that are like, listen, I love Jesus. I'm here, okay? And there's room for you here as well. Uh, I want to welcome everybody watching online today. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been doing a lot of traveling and just spending time kind of pitching the vision of the church around the country. Spent some time in Portland a few weeks ago, in California. We were in Louisiana last week. We were in Florida last week. Um, I've just been talking about what God's been doing in Fredonia. You know, the church that donated these chairs, they flew Randy and I out last week, and we got to go to their spiritual conference, and about 6,000 people in this church. They paid for our flights. They paid for our hotel. They said, listen, we just want to see you keep reaching Fredonia for Jesus. They poured into us. They sowed into our building project. And like, I just had these moments this week where I was blown away by God. Not because like, oh, Randy and I had planted a church. But these connections happen through long, integral, consistent relationships. And sometimes people think like, I just need a better opportunity. And it's like, no, you just need to stay consistent and be focused on the main thing. And God's going to reveal something about you. So this week, um, I'll get into my intro in a second. This week, the Lord showed me this verse in Psalm 25 that really spoke to my heart. The Bible says, the Lord confides in those who fear him. Someone say fear. Like the fear of the Lord. The Bible says that God actually gives us information when we have a healthy fear of the Lord. It says he makes his covenant known to them. This isn't like a fear like you should be afraid of God. This is a fear of what would it might be like if I was separated from God forever. This is like, if I don't obey God, what will he do? This isn't like, oh, I'm afraid of God and I can't have a relationship with my father because I'm afraid of him and my last father was like this. And don't miss this. The fear of the Lord is a healthy understanding that if I don't obey him, he can do something. We're stepping into a day and age where a lot of less people are fearing God. And they're just saying, ah, yeah, I believe. This week, the Lord is really challenging me, and he reminded me of something in this church that we want to be about. We want to have a healthy fear of the Lord here. When we moved from Southern California to Western New York, my wife, all the time, she'd be giving this line to people. They'd say, I can't believe you're moving from the beach, you know, over to Fredonia, like Western New York. It's cold over there. And my my wife's line has been, I'd rather be cold than disobedient. That's what fear of the Lord looks like. It's like, why would I complain about something small? I have to obey him. And so for the next two weeks, I want to things I've been looking at. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about the end times. What's the Bible say about the end of the world? What does the Bible say about Jesus coming back? Next week, we'll dip into some more controversial stuff and just want to be obedient these next two weeks. I'm going to preach like God gave it to me. And uh, if you want to say amen, you can. If you want to leave, you can. But I'm just glad that you came because he's going to speak to us. All right, so if you have your Bible, go with me to 1st, 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2. If you have a Bible, go to 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2. And uh, while you're doing that, I want to welcome anybody in the room that maybe your first time in church with us, maybe your second time in church. Maybe you're not really like a religious person. I want to let you know that today is not about being religious. It's about being available. God's not looking for religious people. He's looking for available people. He's not looking for people that have the ability to do things. He's looking for people that have the availability for him to do something through them. All right. I'm preaching better than you're talking already. All right. 2 Thessalonians. Can we get it on the screen? 2 Thessalonians starting in verse 2. Here reads the word of the Lord. It says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if this is from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. I want you to see that verse three. The last day will not come until the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself 
that he is God. Let me just give you context here. The apostle says, concerning the last day, the day that Jesus comes back, he says, before Jesus comes back, I wanna draw you to verse three, there's gonna be a great falling away. It's gonna be a group of people that at one point were confessing Christianity and have fallen away from that, okay? And this is all good news today. So today I wanna to title this message, Future Glory, as we get into the scriptures. Would you pray with me today? Father, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your spirit. Uh, thank you for the understanding and the insight into your word today. I, here, okay, so eschatology is the study of the end times. The study of the end times is eschatology. This is a word you don't really need to know, but it's a topic you need to know. How does God promise to be with his church in the final days? As rumors of war and talks of war are hitting our news screens and as people are getting more divided and as money is looking a little different now and resources and everything's trying to be decentralized and there's all this stuff going on, what does the church hold on to when we're going through times like this? How do you and I have hope that we can look, you know, death right in the face and not be afraid? Like, how do we have people come to us that are afraid about things, and they come to us, and they expect us to have an answer? How do we have peace of mind, but also give them the truth of God when it comes to this situation? As we were reading in 2 Thessalonians, a very interesting passage of Scripture. Paul has been writing this church in Thessalonica for two, two different books now. We have 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. And pretty much, they're both pretty encouraging letters. There's a couple rebukes in there. There's a couple lines of correction. But towards the end of each book, he actually starts talking about the coming of the Lord. And he starts talking about how, you know, Jesus is going to return one day. Can we still preach messages about Jesus returning? Uh, just, it's not popular anymore. It's not like a self-help thing, but it is what we believe. That one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And so you cannot be a Christian without the foundational understanding that he's coming back, that he came once, but our hope is not just in what he did when he came. Our hope is, what's he going to do when he comes back? And so in 1 Thessalonians, the apostle Paul writes in chapter 4, and he says, when Jesus comes back, he says, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. What he says is Jesus is going to come on the clouds and he's going to come riding on a horse. The Bible gives us this great imagery. It doesn't say he's coming with grace. It says he's coming with judgment. It says that out of his mouth is a sword, not an actual sword, but referring to Hebrews chapter 4, it's saying that he will divide what is right and what is wrong. Okay, he's already been here. He's already invited the world into this. The second time he comes, he's coming to make things right. Well, I'm about justice, and we need to make things right. Can I just tell you, there's a godly justice and a biblical justice that is greater than the kind of justice we think of. We can only do so much in this life, but we have hope that one day God will make all things right. And so Jesus is going to come back, and the Bible says the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Like, you're going to see people get out of their tombs. Like, people that, well, my mom was cremated. I believe the power of God is going to bring everything back together in that moment. It's going to be, I can't even fathom it. And it says the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And then we who remain, the text says, will be caught up with him. This is where we get that word rapture. And just for some people in the room, the Bible doesn't actually use the word rapture ever. Uh, we've come up with that tradition. You know, well, the rapture is going to happen before this, before that. We'll get into all the end times next year. We'll do an extensive study together. But I just want to give you a heads up on something that Paul says in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verse 3. When we started, it says before Jesus comes back, there's going to be a great falling away. What does that mean? Before the return of the Lord, there is going to be a group of people that at one point believed, and they're going to turn from their belief. Uh, apostasy is another term. We're going to go from believing this to now walking away from this. And this hit me this week when I was studying because I came across a recent Barna study that says from the year 2000, to the year 2020, there has been 22 million deconverted Christians. In the last 22 years, 22 million people that at one point were in church loving Jesus now say, I don't even believe in God. Don't tell me that people in World War II were thinking it was the end times. Don't tell me that everyone's been thinking it was the end times since forever. I know, but you can't help but notice how different our time is than those times. You can't help notice that like everyone has a tracking device on them everywhere they go now. And if someone wanted to get a message to the whole world at once, they actually could. 
Back in the 40s and 50s, theologians were baffled by end times theology. They were going like, well, the Bible says we're all going to see it happen at the same time. And in the 30s and the 40s, they couldn't fathom that. They were like, how is everyone going to see it at the same time? This doesn't make any sense. And now we're in 2022, and you're like, oh, we're all going to see it at the same time. So I just want to set that up to make sure you understand, like, you're not in, like, a turn or burn kind of church. Like, this is the end, and, you know, we're conspiracy driven, and, you know, Russia's really Ezekiel 36. Like, we're not there. But it is important we know what the Bible actually says because the point is not to know when the end is coming. The point is to be ready regardless. Are you with me? So can I pastor you this morning? Let me show you what Jesus said about the end. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, it says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven. Watch this, nor the son. So Jesus doesn't even know when he's coming back. Well, how does that make him God? I could give you a Trinity breakdown later if you're really interested, come up, come up to me afterwards. But the Bible says that even Jesus is waiting on the Father to tell him when. You want to talk about servanthood. Servanthood is the only posture in the kingdom of God. Even the Son of God has a servant's posture that says, when do you want me to go? So it says, concerning that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angel in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will it be with the coming of man. And in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. They were unaware until the flood came and swept them away. So will it be with the coming of man. Jesus gives us hints almost like, you remember what it was like in Noah's day. Everyone thought Noah was out of his mind when he was building an ark. You know, it took... Oh, wait, Noah, 120 years to build that ark. 120 years. The Bible actually gives us the exact measurements. There's a place today, I think it's in Kentucky or something, you can go and see like the actual pre-built ark, like the actual size of it, what it looked like. But think about this. Imagine Noah's neighbors seeing him out front one day just building an ark. What are you doing, Noah? I'm building a boat. What's a boat? It's for when it rains. What's rain? They couldn't fathom his thinking because he had an access to God. They didn't. And everyone thought Noah was crazy until it started raining. Everyone thought that Noah was like, whoa, you know, he's really hyping up the end here. He's getting too hyped about this until it actually happened. And so what's important as Christians is not that we know all this to scare people, but if anything, we know this to prepare people that the things we worry about on a daily basis, are they really worth it? The things that we consider detrimental to our mental health, are they really that big of a deal in comparison to the end of the world? I know it's quiet, but this is something I've been wrestling with lately. How do you present the end of the world without scaring people into salvation? You know, I've been in churches where it's like, you know, if you don't know where you're going to go tonight, if you were to get hit by a car as soon as you leave this church and you don't know where you're going, do you need Jesus? It's like, well, of course, everyone's going to say yes to that. But where is the depth and conviction of the church today that says, I still believe in the book of Revelation? I still believe that the time we're in is unlike any other time. It's not the end, but it very well could be the beginning of the end. It could be the birthing pains of what God wants to do in this area and in this time. Before God comes back, you best believe there's going to be a big revival Joel chapter 2 says that God's going to pour out his spirit, and the pouring out of God's spirit is going to be the initiation of one of the biggest revivals the church has ever seen. If 22 million people fell away in the last 22 years, imagine what the revival before the last days could look like. Imagine the Jewish people that have not confessed Jesus as Lord. Imagine the opportunities that they're going to turn and say, he is my Messiah. Imagine the, the, the prodigal sons and daughters that say, yeah, I took communion once at church, but I'm gone. Imagine on the last day how desperate they're going to be for God. Oh, I hope you hear my plea today, church. It's not just about knowing when it happens. We have to be ready regardless. So Jesus gave us his takes on the end. Let me give you John, the disciples' take on the end. Revelation chapter 1 gives us the revelation of Jesus Christ. The, The last book of the Bible is not called Revelations. It's the revelation. I get a lot of revelation from God. You can get revelation from God. You know, my friends get a lot of revelation from God. This isn't just an average revelation. Can we get verse one up, please? Um, It says, the revelation. This is the picture that John got of the end times. Now, here's what you should know about John. He is one of 12 guys that gave 
their lives to following Jesus in the flesh. Uh, one of John's friends, his name was Judas, he actually betrays Jesus. He kills himself out of, out of shame. And then another one is kind of voted in. And, and, and there's some great story on that extra disciple. But out of all the 12 disciples, we know how most of them died. We know that Peter was hung upside down on a cross because he didn't feel worthy. We know that Thomas was stoned to death. We know that, like, if you look at Judas, he hung himself. John is the only disciple that died of natural causes. Funny story about John, they actually tried to boil him in oil. When you look at church history, they were so sick and tired of revival breaking out with John. Every time John would preach, it was either a riot or a revival. That's where we got to be as a church. Like, I'm not here to be in the middle anymore. It's either like, we're going to see revival or people are going to be really mad and leave. Okay? So John is the only disciple that didn't just, he's the only one that died from natural causes. They tried to boil him in oil, but the oil that was in him was greater than the oil they tried to boil him in. They tried to stab him in the side with a sword, and after they pulled it out, he was just still just fine. They couldn't kill him. They couldn't stop him, so they said, let's just put him on an island. And they put him on this island called Patmos. They just exiled him. And as he's exiled, God gives him the most important revelation that the church has got. Besides the the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, he gives him the most important revelation he's ever got. Don't ever curse your exile. Don't ever curse the seasons where you're not around a lot of people. Because that might be the place God needs you to be so he can speak more clearly. Maybe the reason we don't hear is because we got too many voices around us. John is on an island by himself, and he gets the revelation of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 1. The Bible says this, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. I brought this stool up like I was going to sit on it. I'm just too hyped, (laughs) y'all. The things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. John, verse 2, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what it is written, for the time is near. Someone say near. Near. I love the uh, part in verse 3. It says there's a blessing just attached to reading Revelation, and then there's another blessing just attached to hearing Revelation. And then there's a blessing attached to doing revelation. You don't have to know a lot about the Bible to understand the end times. You don't need to have a degree. You don't need to have a bunch of seminary training. But you should know what God says about revelation. And not the book revelation, but about how he reveals things to us. Jeremiah 33 says it like this. Call to me and I will answer you. And I will show you and tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. I hope you know this about God. We serve a God of revelation. We serve a God that wants to reveal something to you. A God that he's leading you. Yes, he's showing you. Yes, he's guiding you. But if he doesn't reveal himself, is he really God? Our religion is not some distant being way up in the sky and like we're waiting for him to talk to us. If anything, he is constantly revealing who he is on the earth. He's constantly speaking through people. He's constantly speaking through situations. So we have a God of revelation. And according to Jeremiah 33, all he says we need to do is call to him. Verse 3 says, call to me and I will answer you. So how's the world going to end, Billy? Ask God. He'll tell you. Well, is this really how things are going to go? Call to God. He promises that if you call to him, he will answer you. Some of your friends won't even answer when you call. Some of your family won't answer when you call. I've been trying to call one dude all week. He won't even clear his voicemail, so I can't even leave him a message. How many people know those people in the room? Every time you call them, the voice message you're calling is full. So so people won't return our call, but look at God. Call to me, and I will answer. And look what he says, and I will tell you great and hidden things. Since the beginning of time, people have been wondering, how's this thing going to end? It's a hidden thing. We, you don't get access to that just by wishing you had access to it. You got to call to him. You got to posture yourself in a way towards him. It shouldn't be to f- make us afraid, but we call to him so we can have peace. 
God does not give us answers so that we know things. He gives us answers so we can have peace. He doesn't give us answers so we can go on Instagram Live and say, I knew it. Russia is actually this verse. That's not the point of Revelation. He gives us revelation so we can have peace regardless of what happens. I have hope and I have assurance in Jesus. So a couple things on end times revelation. If you're taking notes, write these down. Number one, first thing about revelation is revelation is a grace. Revelation is a grace. God doesn't have to reveal things to us. God doesn't have to show us things. He's God. If he wants to keep things hidden, he's entitled to do so. If he wants to give us a crystal clear answer on why that person died or why the miscarriage happened or why the abuse was allowed so long, like sometimes we want these picture perfect answers from God and he doesn't give us picture perfect answers. Sometimes he gives us messy invitations to just walk with him. Moments where we don't have like everything we need, but we have him. Have you been there? Like sometimes you need nothing to remind yourself that Jesus is really all you need. Sometimes you need nothing in the bank, no friends in your corner, the bottom of the bottom, so you can realize he still sees you just as valuable. So Revelations of Grace, verse 1 in the book of Revelation says this, the revelation of Jesus Christ, here it is, which God gave him. It's a grace. He, He gave him to show his servants. It was a blessing that God revealed this. This isn't something that's like, you know, That's right. You better make sure you know what's going on so you make it in the gates one day. It's like, listen, if you have faith in Jesus, no need to get saved again today. Okay, if you have confessed Jesus as Lord, you are following his ways, you are practicing his way. No need to get saved just because you're afraid. If anything, we need to deepen and strengthen our convictions in what we believe. It says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. Someone say he gave it. He gave it. He gave it. it. It wasn't just given to anyone either. Who did he give it to? To him and to his servants. So God gave information to people that were willing to serve. This is why I'll say it again. Servanthood is the only posture in the kingdom of God. I was with a a, a man of God this week, one of my best friends, dad, and been following Jesus like 50 years, used to preach for Billy Graham. Before Billy Graham would open, you know, he was like a young 20-year-old getting up to open for Billy Graham. And then I was asking him about this generation. I said, what do you think about this generation? He says, we have too many specialists and not enough servants. And I go, what do you mean? And he goes, this is the only generation I've heard that is like, yeah, I specialize in this area of ministry versus I'm just willing to serve anywhere. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, the Bible says we need pastors, teachers, prophets, evangelists. It doesn't say we need pastors, teachers, prophets, graphic designers, youth pastors, you know, parking lot attendants. It's just, we're servants. And when you have a heart and a posture to serve, you could care less what people think about you. You're concerned on them. You want to make sure they feel loved, they feel served, they feel recognized. That's why the greatest way to tell someone and serve someone is just to tell them they're loved. Why is you are loved the branding of the church? It's the easiest way to reach someone. You know, I go to gospel church. What church is that? That you are loved people. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just the easiest way for them to know that God loves them. Revelation is a grace. And Revelation is a reminder that God is the one that controls the end. Daniel chapter 2 says this. I'll give you this and we'll move on. He changes times and seasons. Speaking of God, he changes times and seasons. He removes kings and he sets up kings. So there is a sovereignty that God has, okay? He is aware of what's happening. He is the one orchestrating things. He says he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. This is for someone in the room today. He knows what is in the darkness. And the light dwells with him. If you have been afraid of God because you think what you've done, like he's not happy with what you've done, he's already seen it. He's already aware of what's in the darkness. There's one verse in Psalm 139 where it says, even the darkness is as light to him. Because he's not moved by rumors of war. He's not moved by political turmoil. He's not moved by, you know, false Christianity, progressive Christianity. That stuff doesn't, 
He, he, he knows. He's the one that sets things up. He's the one that tears things down. He's aware of what's in darkness, but light dwells with him. If you're in darkness today, revelation is an invitation to get back in the light. The end times shouldn't scare us into be- believing, but they should prompt us to want to know what's actually going to happen. As it gets darker and people get more lower, can I just prophesy to you today that grace is going to reach farther and farther? The Bible tells us that where sin abounds, grace abounds. Where sin abounds much, grace abounds much more. So as the world gets darker, you better believe the church is going to keep growing because we're going to keep reaching. We're going to keep loving because this is a grace from God to show what's going to happen. So revelation is a grace. Number two, revelation is inside information. Revelation is inside information. You don't just get revelation from saying, yes, I'm a Christian, I believe. You get a certain amount to know like what Jesus did and all this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, most of the times, we want the benefits of discipleship without the cost of discipleship. We want the information that's only reserved for the need to know people, but we don't want to put in any of the work that the need to know people put in. Are you following me? We want God to speak, but we don't want to move. We want God to orchestrate things, but we don't want to position ourselves. So it's like we can't wait for him to do something. We have to recognize he's revealing something to those that come close. I was at a soccer match a couple years ago with one of my best friends, and we were in downtown L.A., and uh, we were hanging out. We are getting ready to go to Pasadena, and it was like the L.A. Galaxy playing like FC Barcelona. And they were like in town. It was this big old thing. And so we go to the Rose Bowl it was playing at maybe 90,000 people there. And uh, me and my friend, you know, there's maybe 1,000 L.A. Galaxy fans and 89,000 Barcelona fans. And I'm an L.A. Galaxy fan. You know, so, like, we're showing up, like, with our gear and stuff, and everyone's just staring at us. And, you know, we go to the usher, and here's our tickets, man. He almost, like, laughed at us. Our tickets were so bad. Like, they were, like, nosebleed past the nosebleed, like, forehead bleed high. You know what I mean? Like, just way high, out the ears kind of stuff, all right? And so we go all the way up to the top, and we're way in the back of the building. And, you know, there's 90,000 people. And we're way back here. And, 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 and Barcelona scored a goal. And down on the field, you could see, like, the supporter sections. They got drum, doom, 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 doom. People are jumping. Ah, people are throwing their drinks in the air, hugging each other. And we're way in the back. And some Barcelona next to us fans were sitting right next to us. And Messi scored. And the Barcelona fan went, yeah. Woo. I'm like, if L.A. scores, I'm going to scream in this dude's face right now. You know what I mean? But down on the field, it was like they were right there. Way off in the distance, it was like, yeah. This is what I mean by revelations inside information. Unless you're willing to get close enough to what's going on, <laughs> you're probably not going to think this is important. Like, you might be here today, and you're, if you're an unbeliever, this sounds crazy. If you're an unbeliever, this probably sounds scary. But it's because your proximity is a little different than some other people in the room that are saying, he could come back tonight, and I'm ready. He could show up tonight, and I'm ready, Father. That's the kind of place I'm talking about. It's inside information. He only shows it to his servants. Look at verse 1 again. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. He didn't give this information to just the average uh, temple worker in Jerusalem. He, He didn't give this to Matthew, the tax collector. He didn't give this to any of these other people that were playing important roles. He gave it to John. He gave it to somebody that when Jesus was at the table, John was leaned up against his chest. He gave it to the one whom literally would write about himself and describe himself as the one whom Jesus loved. This information didn't just come to anybody. It came to a servant. It came to somebody that was on the inside. May we be people that want to stay close, people that want to stay intimate with God, okay? Jesus, why would he reveal this to us? Well, in his ministry, he said he would. John 15 says this, no longer do I call you servants, For the servant does not know what his master is doing. Okay, so we've got salvation, we've got servanthood, and now Jesus is actually going further. So he's saying it's one thing to be a servant, but let me show you a little deeper. He says, no longer do I call you servants, because they don't know what the master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all that I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. So proximity to Jesus affects what our relationship is like. It's one thing to have a servant's heart. 
It's another thing to be considered a friend of God. Like, where's your life at today? Can God call you friend? You know, friendship is, is, is different than just kind of like acquaintances. You ever heard of somebody say, you got any friends? And they're like, I have acquaintances. What are they saying? There's a certain amount of boundaries I've placed before I call someone a friend. Can I tell you, Jesus is the same way. He, he has a certain amount of things, <laughs> boxes almost to get checked off before he invites you into friendship. Salvation is a gift. Salvation is free, but friendship's costly. Friendship will have you waking up at five in the morning because your daughter gets up at six. And if you don't spend time with him, you feel empty. Friendship will have you, you know, getting done preaching and being excited. You just preached the biggest conference you've ever done and then spending two hours in his presence because you want to do it again. And, you know, you can't do it without him. Friendship is before I give money to my landlord or I give money to my bills. Friendship is, God, I trust you that I'm going to trust you with my resources because I actually want to see what you're doing. Uh, I think a healthy fear of the Lord today is to ask yourself, am I in friendship with Jesus? Or is he just like my, belief, my, my teacher? Is he just the prophet? Is he just God or is he your friend? If you're here as an unbeliever, this kind of sounds a little crazy, sounds a little scary. But if you're here as a believer and you're ready to see what the end actually is going to be like and what you can do in the end, then I think he's inviting you into close friendship today. Revelations is inside information. Lastly, number three, revelation is a responsibility. So we're in the end times. We're talking about when Jesus comes back. I, as I mentioned, next year we'll go into like a full sermon series on this. We'll get into like all the pictures and, you know, the, the books that talk about things and, you know, the seven-headed dragon and like, you know, the beast and all that stuff that people love to eat up. We'll get into that. I want to make sure we go into that the right way. But I don't want you to miss this main point about the end times. Revelation is a responsibility. If God has shown us what's going to take place, we have a responsibility to tell people. And I'm not talking about like go on the side of the road and say you're going to hell if you, if you don't accept Jesus. I don't, I don't think that's very effective. But I think it starts with the people in my life right now. Do they know where I'm at with Jesus? Not like do they know I believe the world's ending. Please don't be that guy or that girl. You know, hey, I went to church and my pastor wanted me to tell you that the world's ending this week. You need to accept Jesus. They will never talk to you again. But there ought to be an urgency in us when we get together for church. There, there ought to be a reverence when we come into the house of God. You know, there used to be a time as you were walking up to the house of God, you'd be like, you got gum in your mouth, there'd be someone at the front door. You remember that? Spit that gum out. One of the church mothers, spit that gum out. You know, you ever be in here for worship and like sitting down? And I'm not talking about like sitting down, like enjoying the presence of God. You're just sitting down, hands crossed, just meh. Used to be a time when someone would lean over to you and say, hey, sit up, have some reverence. But now we don't want to offend anybody and we don't want to get too controversial with things. And listen, I have no problem when people out there don't want to talk about this stuff. I do have a problem when people in here don't want to talk about it because we're the ones that need to know what's going on. So God reveals to John the end of the world. You know what his responsibility was? Write it down and make sure someone else hears. You know, every week you come and we hear a message and our faith is built and we're encouraged and our problems, we're like feeling good about them. We have a responsibility to let that now overflow into someone else. God doesn't just reveal things to us because he wants us to know. He reveals things because he can trust us with them. Oh. Thank you for trusting us with your heart, God. Thank you for trusting me with the word. Thank you for trusting this church to be an answer for someone's problems. He trusts us. Revelation is a responsibility. Verse three, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are the one who hear the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who keep what is written in it. So you got to read it, you got to hear it, and then you got to keep it. That seems like so much. Maybe when you try to do it on your own, it is. When I read Revelation by myself, I get a little scared. But when I bring my wife into my study and I say, hey, what do you think of this? All of a sudden, we're in it together. Maybe that's why Jesus said where two or three are, I'm in the midst. Because he knew once we got together, that's when he wants to show up. Revelation is a responsibility we have to tell people what's coming. 
to tell people that, yeah, there's grace. And yes, the gospel is good news. But the gospel is a past victory that creates a present reality and that gives us future hope. Can I give you the equation? Past victory. What he did on Calvary is finished. If you're here today and you think Christianity is like a bunch of stuff to do, sorry, it is finished. It is finished. I was in Lafayette talking to a young kid at a coffee shop, and uh, he came to meet me and my friend. He's Christian, Buddhist, hybrid right now. He's kind of like in between and stuff. And, and, and he says, you know, I'm just, just so infatuated. What are you guys' thoughts on the Buddha? What are you guys' thoughts on the Buddha? Like, what are your thoughts on the Buddha? He kept asking me that. I was like, well, you know, you know, G- like Jesus is kind of like a little different than Buddha. Like, yeah, I get they both had disciples, and yeah, I get they both left a message, and yeah, I both, yeah, like I get the similarities. Um, but, but, but Buddha often told you something to do. And Jesus' best line was, it is finished. Like Buddha is like, do this and it'll be well. And Jesus is like, it's already finished. And so it's a, pres- it's a past victory, but it's a present reality. If you need hope today, if you need joy today, if you need strength today, right here, right now, today's the day of salvation. Today is the day that you can find freedom. Today is the day, right here, present reality. But that present reality gives us a future hope. That yes, judgment is imminent. And yes, one day this thing will fall and the flowers will fade and the earth will pass away. But the word of the Lord will endure forever. And you and I can have hope in that today. Not because we are afraid of the times, but because we hear what God is saying. Have you ever noticed this? There's a difference between hearing something and listening to something. Like, we're all hearing the same stuff today. But are we all actually listening? Like, we all hear the same thing on the news. The question is, are you listening to what's being said on the news? Did you know that the word listen appears in the scriptures 1,500 times? But yet the most complaining that's done by Moses or like Old Testament prophets, the number one thing they often complain about is, God, they're not listening. So the blessing of revelation is not just so you got it and you can check it off, say, oh, I know what's going to happen, but it's so that you can listen to what the Spirit is saying today. It's not about knowing when He's coming. It's about being ready. It's not about having all the answers. It's about being a friend of God. It's not just about, you know, I've heard it and I'm not going to do anything with it. It's I have a responsibility to live this life so that when people look at me, they think there must be a God the responsibility we have. Jesus says in John 14, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. How do, how do you hear this verse? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Maybe you're like that. You hear it like this. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Like, If you really love me, you better keep them. I choose to hear this verse like this. Hey, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Like, if if I'm your focal point, if I'm the goal, you'll keep the commandments. Don't even worry about those. Focus on me. The easiest way to avoid sinning is to focus on Jesus. The easiest way to fall into sin is keep focusing on your sin. Keep glorifying your sin, what you've done, how much you messed up, what God didn't do for you, and you didn't do this, and you don't deserve this. The more we focus on Jesus, the less we focus on sin. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments the responsibility of following me, you'll love me. How do you hear that verse, friend? Because if you hear it as something to do, you might be missing the greatest message ever told. You know, the greatest message ever told is God saw broken humanity and didn't wait. (laughs) I've been on and off the phone with New York State just about different like insurance things for the church here and different like nonprofit stuff. And and, and they, they just, they just... I love them. (laughs) But I was on the phone and my last conversation to them was, well, why did you wait? Like, why did you wait to tell me this? You know what I mean? Why like, and everything's good too. Don't worry. Some of y'all are looking at me like, are we legit? We're legit. This is something else. Why did you wait? God's not waiting. He saw humanity. He didn't wait. He sent his son in the image of man. We were made in the image of God only because God was willing to become like man. And when God became like man, he died the death we deserve. He resurrected, and today we can have hope, not because of us, but because of him. 
So if you don't know Jesus today, friend, how do you hear this verse? If you love me, you better keep my commandments. Or maybe you hear it as, if you love me, you will keep those commandments. Come to Jesus today, friend. Don't wait for the end times. If you're watching online, don't wait until something official comes across your news screen. Don't wait until, you know, your conspiracy friends actually scare you into thinking this could happen tomorrow. Like, don't wait. Come to Jesus today. He's so free. He is so accessible.